Might hear a few curse words in this one. Just a warning. With MailChimp, you get more than a URL. You get an all-in-one marketing platform to help drive sales. With things like data-driven recommendations and powerful automation tools. Get started today at MailChimp.com slash smart marketing. MailChimp, built for growing businesses. Hi, I'm Stefan Fatsis, and this is Slate's Sports Podcast. Hang up and listen for the week of August 23rd, 2021. On this week's show, it's a guest fest. Track and field writer Jojo Gretchel joins us to discuss Shikari Richardson's boastful and then bungled return to the 100-meter dash over the weekend. Spoiler alert, she finished dead last. We'll break down Draymond Green's revealing interview with Kevin Durant and what it says about sports and media with former player turned media member Rod Benson. And finally, big get Claire McNear of The Ringer fills us in on her blockbuster reporting about the offensive comments that brought down the guy who was supposed to replace Alex Trebek as the host of Jeopardy. Josh Levine is off this week, but go listen to his podcast, Series One Year, 1977. I'm the author of the books Word Freak, A Few Seconds of Panic, and Wild and Outside. I'm in Washington, D.C., across the country in Palo Alto, California. It's Slate staff writer and Slow Burn Seasons three and upcoming season six host and future milk crate challenge champion joel anderson mm-hmm. what's up joel i'm good man how you doing this morning don't do that milk crate challenge man we'll see and also you're you're an athlete you should maybe give it a shot there's no way i saw one tiktok of a dude falling on his back and landing on those plastic crates there's no way in hell you would you would get me to do that you just saw one huh <laughs> I mean, that's, I, that's all i needed to see i did see the woman <laughs> in high heels conquer the milk crate mountain look Steph. i mean to be honest there was a guy i saw roll a blunt at the top of the mountain of crates and that's what made me think if that guy could do it i think i could do it All right, let's get to the show. Actually, let's not get to the show, Joel. You didn't think we were going to let you get away without talking about what happened in that trivia tournament on Bomani Jones's podcast, did you? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I lost, obviously. But again, as I mentioned at the time, I mean, two of the questions were about baseball, one about hockey. Uh, I just feel like that's culturally biased. Oh, man, the excuses are coming already. No, 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 no. no. You didn't think I was prepared for this. So you get the first question. It's a baseball question. Congratulations. Who made the -the over-the-head basket catch in the 1954 World Series? That's kind of a gimme. Willie Mays. And then this happened, Joel. (laughs) Which player holds the single-game NBA record for three-point field goals? I think this is counter to it. Hold on. Okay, it's it's one of... I'm just going to give what I think is the wrong answer, but... What? No, actually, actually... Is it Steph? You asking or you telling? <laughs> uh, Steph Curry. Close. Clay Thompson. Oh, Clay Thompson. I knew. Oh my God! I knew. Oh man! <laughs> all right. Uh, first of all, this is I'm being ambushed. I didn't know this was going to happen this morning. <laughs> but I knew it was either Steph or Clay, and I was like, it seems obvious that it's Clay, and I thought it was counterintuitive. I was like, okay, it was like one of those deals. Do you remember? Hearing about how when the Celtics, like Kevin McHale set the franchise record for scoring in a game, and then the next game, Larry Bird came back and set the record the next game. And I, I thought that was what happened with Clay and Steph, and I got confused. You know what? All I'm hearing here, Joel, is excuses, because if the Clay answer or non-answer was bad enough, the next question, what's the distance between the bases on a standard professional baseball field? Okay, again, culturally biased. Okay, let me just say, it's got to be... Uh, let me just get a lifeline. 75 feet, 90 feet, 30 yards, or 15 yards. Hmm. What was this, the, the first one again? I'm a little confused at how this, yeah. these multiple choices were added, but it was 75 feet, 90 75 feet, feet, 30 yards, or 15 yards. 75 feet. You really could have gotten this one right. We had two right answers in there. (laughs) The answer is 90 feet or 30 yards. yards, Also 30 yards. (laughs) Yeah. 90 feet. I mean, I'm really falling apart here. Man, you know what I thought? I was like, well, basketball court is 94 feet. And I was like, there ain't no way that's this between home plate and first base. Joel, you get one. You get like 30 seconds now to explain. What I would say is that I, I was thinking, okay, a basketball court is 94 feet. 
surely the distance between bases is at 90 feet. That was, that's what I was thinking the whole time. I was like, I know baseball players don't run that far. They don't look like they run that far. So I was just confused, and I haven't, I haven't been on a baseball field in a number of years. So, again, I think it was culturally biased. Also, Howard, my opponent, Howard got Bryant. two questions. Yeah, who's great. But he got two questions about Boston-related themes back-to-back. And then he got a hockey question, which is right up his alley. So I just kind of felt like I got a little bit cheated, but that's fine. You know, I mean, that, that they can have their ratings bust in the final if they want. But I feel like Gabe, Gabe, who is the producer of uh, Bomani's show, they were working against me, I think, Stefan. I think, you know. Oh, man, conspiracy theories. All right, we've heard enough, Joel. Let's get to the show. If you tuned into the Prefontaine Classic this weekend, hoping to see the triumphant return of new American sprinting sensation Shakari Richardson, you were out of luck. There was no triumph. But if you tuned in hoping for a good show and maybe a little drama, then you got exactly what you were looking for. This was supposed to have been the long-awaited showdown between the Jamaican sprinters who swept the 100-meter medal stand in Tokyo and Richardson, who won the 100 during the U.S. Olympic trials but missed the games because she later tested positive for marijuana. Instead, on Saturday, the Jamaicans once again ran away from the field and were led by Olympic gold medalist Elaine thompson Hera who ran 10.54 seconds for the second fastest time in women's history. Meanwhile, Richardson lost in the 100 for only the second time all year, finishing dead last. Today, we're joined by JoJo Gretschel, who has covered track for more than a decade at places like ESPN+, Plus, Flow Track, and Mile Split, and who was a track and cross-country runner at Tulane University. JoJo is currently the managing editor of The Striker Texas, an app and website covering soccer at all levels in the Lone Star State, JoJo, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. So, look, you saw the meet on Saturday. What in the hell do you think happened to Shakari? <laughs> oh my god, I don't. I think I'm still not over it. Now that we've had two days to process it, uh, it kind of makes sense. You know, she has had a whirlwind month after the Olympic trials, and it would be a really tall order for her to go up against these women. Not only, you know, the top three women at the Olympics this year, but stacked up against the best sprinters of all time. Elaine Thompson-Hara, who you mentioned, and Shellyanne Fraser-Price are two of the best sprinters ever. But it seems like all of the distractions around her marijuana suspension kind of took away a little bit from focus on training. I'm going to, on the other hand, this and say that the Jamaicans were attempting to peak at the Olympics. Clearly, the Olympics is the most important meet on the calendar this year. And Richardson, after her suspension, made it clear that she had six weeks to train and prepare for this this meet in Oregon. Um, So if anybody should have been in peak form, it should have been Shakari Richardson. Yeah, I mean, you would think she had all the time in the world, didn't have to travel to Tokyo, didn't have to deal with all the, you know, COVID regulations that those athletes had to go through. Uh, and definitely a lot of people uh, who went to Tokyo came back and then came to Eugene. A lot of athletes talked about how difficult and fatiguing that travel was. So I do think that's a good point. It does seem like her her kind of newfound mainstream fame has given her a lot of different opportunities in the last six weeks that she wasn't dealing with, you know, trying to be in a Kanye West music video, uh, you know, doing a, an ad for like new headphones, uh, Sort of, she's just popped off on all these different things. I think she flew straight from the Olympic trials to like be on the red carpet at the ESPYs, which, you know, all of that kind of adds up over time and definitely must have had a bit of an impact on uh, like her training. So she got out poorly. And I thought that at around 20 meters, she realized she couldn't win. Do you Do you think that as well? Because I haven't heard anybody say that, but to me, it just looked like, I'm already behind and I'm not going to be able to catch up. Did you feel that way to you? Yeah, I I think she traditionally doesn't have the best start in the world. She just has great acceleration through the race. Uh, But we didn't see that. She was kind of, you know, even with the pack, didn't get out super well. And yeah, about midway through, she just kind of was moving backwards. Yeah, Uh, Just didn't have it. And it, it did feel like, you know, maybe maybe it's a mental thing where she realized she wasn't going to win or going to be in that top three spot even and figured, 
you know, and I don't want to put words in her mouth because I'm, you know, I don't need her coming after me on Twitter. But uh, <laughs> it did seem like she, yeah, she gave up a little bit. She finished six tenths of a second behind Thompson Hurrah, which is in hundred, you know, terms an eternity. And you watch the race, and it is kind of shocking. And I think Joel, you're right. It felt like something went wrong, and she just realized I'm not coming close here. But the 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 thing that I that and this is she's a complex personality. We need to talk about her reaction to failure here, and maybe this is the time to do it. When she came off the track, she didn't come off the track saying, "I had a bad race. Um, I got to get back in training." She came off the track blowing fire. Let's listen to her interview with NBC as soon as the race ended. Coming out today. You know what I'm capable of. Count me out if you want to. Talk all the shit you want. Because I'm here to stay. I'm not done. I'm the sixth fastest woman in this game ever. And can't nobody ever take that from me. Congratulations to the winners. Congratulations to the people that won. But they're not done seeing me yet. Those are not the words of a woman who was feeling deflated or contrite. Or maybe there's an insecurity coming out there for all of the hype over the last... Um, two months surrounding her, she might have been a little embarrassed. Yeah, I mean, that's that that pure, uh, you know, post-race failure. You know, that's, a, that's a tough interview to do, right? Like, you don't have a minute to decompress, get your feelings together. That's, that's just that pure after-race feeling. Because uh, I actually just watched uh, her Mix Zone interview right before this, where she had calmed down a little bit. And she actually... Uh, did a, a Shakari apology, <laughs> where she said, "You know, that was uh, that was my raw feelings after that, and uh, you know, I respect the women who won." Although I do think it's funny she still doesn't mention anybody else's name who won. <laughs> and I'm not sure if you guys saw. I mean, these clips are like making the rounds now, but the Shelly Ann Fraser Price like walks right behind her. Yes. She's giving that interview, gives a little side eye. It's so funny. And then today, Shakari actually made that her uh, profile picture on Twitter. So I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this this poster's interview was not a good look for her. She definitely doesn't feel very sportsmanlike. Uh, but I think it's all part of her persona, too, right? She's kind of created this. Um, there's just no other woman in the sport who is this, like, raw and aggressive with her emotions and the way she talks about the sport and what it means to her. Uh, she's very unique. Well, you know, it, it's interesting you mentioned that she didn't she didn't say the names of the other runners because I think one of the more unfortunate developments from Saturday was that Elaine thompson Haras performance was almost sort of overlooked, right? Um, because as we mentioned at the top, she ran the second fastest time in women's history. And to your point, Jojo, you like she's great. I mean, she won golds in Rio and Tokyo, run the second fastest times in the history of the 100 and 200 and can theoretically do it again in Paris uh, when she'll be only 33 years old. So can you put into context for us like how dominant Elaine Thompson Harias, because like that 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 performance sort of seemed to be the pinnacle of everything she'd been building toward in the last few years. Oh yeah, I mean, no one else has ever run under ten six except for Florence Griffith Griffith Joyner, uh, who's the world record holder. I mean, I actually did a little bit of research on her one hundred meter world record, which is ten forty nine, and uh, there's some. Uh, a lot of people in the track world believe that that's actually not a wind legal world record because there was like a faulty wind reading that day. Uh, you know, and there's some track and field statisticians who, who work with like world athletics who don't even count it in their rec record bookkeeping. So it is something that is a um, it's controversial in the sport, whether 1049 is real or not. And if you don't count that time, Flojo's second fastest time was 1061, which Elaine ran at the Olympics. So now to come out and run 1054, that's not a time we've ever seen, except for one time in 1988, which may have been really wind dated. So, you know, to go back to Shikari, 
competing against, I would say, the greatest sprinter of all time, you would you would see at halfway, oh, wow, you know, she's got a few str- – you know, she's not used to somebody beating her by that much. So, but yeah, I mean, Elaine, it's sort of too bad that they didn't interview her on camera right away after that race and instead, you know, picked – the girl who got last, who obviously is not happy with her performance, but Elaine should really get her flowers this year because you could argue that she's the fastest woman of all time. And it does have to beef them a little bit, the Jamaican sprinters, that there is all this attention on Shikari. And look, Shikari is milking this and becoming a celebrity, and she's drawing attention to, to track, and she is compelling to watch, and marketers have certainly... Um, are attracted to her um, right before the race. NBC in a split screen aired her latest Nike ad in which she says, I've been waiting, waiting to show you that I'm more than a news headline, waiting to show you all why I'm that girl. Um, Do you think that the performance here diminishes that at all? Or do you think that, you know, this is America, man, the media loves out there, athletes and celebrities and Shakari Richardson is just getting warmed up. Yeah, I think it really depends what she's able to do in her last few races of the season. Uh, after this weekend, watching that Nike video feels a little like, ooh, this is a little, you know, she couldn't back it up. If you have a lot of talk, it's great, but you have to back it up. So I think if she's able to come out these last couple races over in Europe, the other Diamond League races, and she's able to run some more like 10-8, 10-7 again, maybe beat the Jamaicans if... I mean, I don't know if anyone's beating Elaine this year, but to actually be competitive in a race, uh, not get last, I, I think that's what she has to do. She she kind of has a hill to climb right now to prove herself. Yeah. I, th- I think that's that, that's that's the good point, that like she still has a, a long way to go. She's really young. Like This is really her first mm-hmm. international competitive year, right? Like This is not... It's not like she, she's got a huge resume here, a lengthy resume where she's been doing this for three or four years and has been through this before. And all of it seemed to kind of come together in this summer. Well, maybe it's not, you know, <laughs> this is maybe not quite fair to her. Um, that You know, she's young. She hasn't dealt with this sort, this sort of defeat, this sort of attention. And, like, you know, she can take this and learn from it. But I, I kind of wanted to, to pivot to, and I want to see if you agree with me, JoJo, about who the best American women's track athlete is and will be for the next decade. A Thing Mo, uh, who won the gold medal in Tokyo in the 800, and then on Saturday ran her personal best in that race and wasn't even pushed, even though the entire, or basically the entire competitive field from Tokyo was there. Do you agree with me? Oh, yeah. She's the future of the sport. Uh, she's just incredible. I think to have that much expectation and pressure on her at 19 years old and actually live up to it. Uh, is is so hard to do and just a testament to how mature of an athlete she is and just how much of a superstar she is really because there's always kind of these young phenoms who come in um, and there's a lot of hype and, and once you reach that like Olympic trial stage I think it gets harder to live up to the pressure especially after having a long college season but she's incredible. The other thing about her I think is great. I feel like she's the perfect age for the next like two Olympic cycles, because she's only 19 right now. So Paris 2024 and uh, Los Angeles, she is going to be in her peak. Joel, these are sort of different approaches to track, but we're talking about track. And Shikari Richardson is, um, is sort of feeding that. I mean, it does not hurt when there's an athlete that people are paying attention to who's, you know, putting up videos, lip syncing to Nicki Minaj, saying it's game time, bitches. I mean, that's, in a way, good for the sport, and it sort of lifts all boats, I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't don't think there's any question that Shakari is good for track and field. Um, There's not been that many people that can draw attention um, outside of the small cohort of track enthusiasts like, you know, JoJo and myself, right? Um, So that Shakari has even become sort of this pop culture figure is a testament to how great she is and how compelling she is as a personality. And the things that we see in her, the things that people say, oh, we need to sand down these edges or whatever. I think a lot of that is youth and inexperience and trauma. Like she's had a really difficult year, but um, I like, Anybody that would count her out over what happened on Saturday, I mean, that would just be silly. Like, she just got, you know, her comeuppance by, as JoJo said, you know, two of the greatest 
female sprinters in, in, in human history, right? So uh, I think that's the thing that maybe Americans didn't understand. Like, they didn't know how good the Jamaicans were. And you got a sense for like how good they were on Saturday. And that may have happened in the Olympics, even if Shakiri had gone right on and not been suspended in the first place. So Yeah, we were talking about this. Like, it almost is better for the Shakiri brand, every all the craziness that happened because it very was it very much was likely she'd go to Tokyo and, you know, at that point, you know, you can be lucky to make the final and not necessarily medal against that field because it was a really tough field. So now she kind of has this big storyline following her and with the age that she is right now uh you know there's it's the perfect time to be in in top form as an athlete because there's world championships the next two years then there's another olympics and she's going to be in her prime for the next two olympic cycles whereas shelly ann is like 33 years old elaine's 31 so they're not going to be here for all of shikari's career jojo gretchel striker texas to lane track great thank you so much for joining us today and we'll have to have you back on when shakari inevitably makes headlines again okay for sure thanks so much guys and in the next segment we're going to talk about that interview between draymond green and kevin durant with former basketball player and current artist and columnist rod benson Hang Up and Listen is brought to you by Progressive. What's one thing you'd purchase with a little extra savings? A weighted blanket? Smart speaker? That new self-care trend you keep hearing about? Well, Progressive wants to make sure you're getting what you want by helping you save money on car insurance. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. Discounts like having multiple vehicles on your policy. Progressive offers outstanding coverage and award-winning claim service. Day or night, they have customer support 24-7, 365 days a year. When you need them most, they're at their best. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com and see why four out of five new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed in 2020. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. Kevin Durant's final game with the Golden State Warriors came in Game 5 of the 2019 NBA Finals when he crumpled to the court with a torn right Achilles. It was a deflating close to a thrilling run when the Warriors won 74% of their games in two or three championships. The third one slipping from their grasp when Durant went down with his injury. In the next offseason, Durant left the Bay for Brooklyn to start his own super team with Kyrie Irving and then later James Harden. But one of the NBA's greatest mysteries is why the Warriors dynasty came apart and how it came apart so quickly. Last week, the Bleacher Report published a fascinating interview between Durant and his former teammate Draymond Green to discuss publicly, for the first time, some of the reasons their pairing lasted only three years. Do you have any regrets about that, knowing that we probably would have won five more championships? No, I don't don't have any regrets at all. I felt like we did exactly what we were supposed to do. And I wish we would have three-peated because that's rare. And we were like right there. Um, But I don't have any regrets at all because I feel like if we just stay healthy with the Nets, we had a great chance to finish mm-hmm. it too. Mm-hmm. So, um, no, nah, I mean, being hurt for that year really changed my perspective on everything that I was doing and everything that I did before. I looked at that time with playing with the Warriors as so special to me, but it was time to move on. So to discuss that interview and more, we're joined by Rod Benson, a former college star at Cal Berkeley and professional basketball player who today is an artist analyst for the Pac-12 Network, and a contributor to SF Gate. Rod, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Rod, last week you wrote a column for SF Gate saying that the Green-Durant interview might herald a new future for sports media. What did you see in that interview that made you feel that way? Yeah, I mean, it was just immediately compelling. And I think, you know, what I kind of realized is that the the swell of of, um, attention it got uh, from casual and, you know, more advanced fans 
you know, they didn't care that it wasn't inaccurate, you know, what they were talking about. They just, it was just still compelling. And I think that, you know, sports media for a long time has really wanted to be accurate and get the scoop and get these things that may be true, but aren't more compelling than just watching two guys talk. And I think that's exactly right, Rod. What stands out in that interview is the level of candor. But I think you also have to start with the fact that Dre and KD are deeply introspective and thoughtful. What they say, regardless of platform, is almost always worth hearing. And they're willing to share their inner emotions, which not all athletes are. That's partly because they're stars and they've got agency. You wrote in that SF Gate column, they are above consequence, and that means they have total control. So this quality of conversation isn't always, I think, replicable. Not every player has interesting things to say, and not every player feels comfortable saying them. Yeah, I I actually disagree. I think, you know, having been in locker rooms over and over again, there's no more interesting conversation than between the guys in that room. Because a lot, you know, part of making it to that level and each level I've gone up, you see more of this is having a personality that can handle, you know, everything that comes with it. So, you know, most locker rooms I've been in, like some of the funniest, most interesting conversation happens there. And I think that the more, you know, especially the younger guys are saying more and more like Anthony Edwards, who people Mm -hmm. just love to hear talk and that because he's just not afraid to be himself like players I used to play with used to be. Well, don't you think, though, right, that, that, like, I'll just even from your piece, you said it was an interesting interview, not a well done interview. And we know that that's sort of besides the point, right? It doesn't matter if it was well done, as you mentioned. But I mean, there are a lot of athletes that have podcasts and, you know, are attempting to tell their own story that don't make nearly the waves that this stuff does. Do you really think that, like, it could? I mean, I guess you, I mean, you, you've mentioned that in the locker room, the dudes are compelling, but like, do you really think that, you know, even. That there's a market for so many, you know, I, I guess if I just said if Jeff Green started a podcast, you like you think there's a, a market for the Jeff Green podcast? Well, I would say that, you know, why this one was particularly compelling is, you know, just the level of stardom that these players have. I think if, you know, Jeff Green won the NBA title this year and hit the game winner to do so. Yes, people would want to hear what he has to say. And part of it is also that the Warriors you know, dynasty came to an end in such a way that I think just people want to know more about that. But I, I would, I would posit that there's so many different versions that like, I would love to hear like Pat Beverly interview mm-hmm. Devin Booker, right? Two guys you wouldn't put at the top of the list, but as they were getting into it in last year's playoffs, wouldn't it be exciting to like have Pat Beverly be like Devin Booker? Like, how did it feel when I said this to you and have him give a real answer? Right. And and this goes to, and you know, I didn't mean to imply that athletes don't have interesting things to say. I mean, I wangled my way into an NFL locker room as a player for an entire training camp and then wrote a book about it. And the most interesting players and the guys that I focused on were not the stars. Um, they were the players who trusted me, whose trust I was able to gain, who opened up to me. So the value proposition to me has always been not who won last night's game or who's starting and who's not. But the value proposition is understanding who athletes are, how they do it, and what they think and feel. And you're right. The middleman doesn't always allow room for athletes to express that. Is that right? And I think what you're saying is that we're we're able to see more of that when then you were playing than when you were playing. That's exactly what I'm saying. And what I mentioned in my article is that, you know, I had consequences for this, but I did it anyway. And as one of the first people to do it, yeah, people were compelled with what I had to say just because it was different. And literally, I'm, and I write about my MySpace messages I was getting. I write about when I went to Indy, how like great Steak and Shake was. I never had it. You know, things like that where, you know, just because it was like different, people were like, man, like we want more of this. And I wasn't anywhere near the top of, you know, any sort of food chain. It just was a, a regular person's life as an athlete. But over the course of the years, your answers to the media, how you deal with the media has changed. Why is that? Is that just who you grew into? Is that because of the way they act with certain shit? Where did that? I felt like the media knew more than me. I almost had them on a pedestal of like, they got more history, knowledge of the game. They more experienced than me in this area of the NBA. So once I started to get more experience and realized like, oh no, they, they, they can never be what I am Mm -hmm. or know what I know or understand it the way I understand it. Some of the questions, you know, they didn't seem so intelligent to me anymore. People wanted to praise me more than I liked or 
hate me more than I like, make a big deal out of so much other shit. And I was just like, you know, this game is simple to me. So some of the stuff that y'all asking really doesn't move me the way it used to. All right, Rod, I see your head shaking there. Uh, what did you, <laughs> <laughs> what did you, I mean, first of all, what did you think of him saying that? And I and just even taking it back to your own experience, do you think that that's a commonly held belief or feeling in locker rooms? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot to unpack from what he said there. Um, I would say from a baseline perspective, yeah, I think a lot of people agree with that. I think especially, I did like how he says, that coming up, he just assumed that these people deserve respect because I think every athlete feels that way. And that's why we tend to be candid as younger athletes until and I wrote an article like we end up burned at some point for saying something. Because, again, when a, when a journalist is writing an article, usually the more compelling thing is negative because um, we already assume the greatness of the athletes. Uh, I do think it's interesting, though, that he also doesn't say like he didn't just stop answering questions a certain way. He's like known for being quite angry and being asked these questions. So again, it like, it kind of goes back to the idea that he's sharing new information, which is great. And it's compelling to hear like, wow, this is like an evolution of dealing with the media. And it's also like, but because of media members not there, we're not, no one's asking a follow-up question, like anything from the victory machine. Is any of that true? Because if it is, it's more than just while you outgrew the media, it's like you have a real anger towards being portrayed any way that's not exactly the way you like. Right. So there's this there's this push and pull, Rod, right? You want, as you write in your piece, you want good reporters who care about getting at the truth. And you said about this interview, I wanted someone to really get to the bottom of things and ask Durant why he and Green fought in the first place. I wanted someone to ask what Steph Curry was doing during this whole ordeal. So you know, do you feel like there's a place for everybody here? And it's just that now we have these great athletes who know how to harness the media. Cause look, Draymond Green and Kevin Durant are really, really good at this. And let's not kid ourselves. Like Dre knew how to give us some broccoli here headlines, you know, Steve Kerr and Bob Myers, the GM of the Warriors fucked up how they handled the blow up between Draymond and Durant um, but at the same time, that allowed them to get to the sort of deeper place. So, you know, how do you envision this going forward, the sort of balance between what the traditional media does well and what athletes are recognizing they have the platform and ability to do? Yeah, I mean, I guess what I really got to is that I don't know if it matters, right? Like, I wanted all these questions answered, but... I guess who cares? I still watched it. Right. I'm still interested. We're still talking about it, right? Like the last dance, you know how many questions I have about the last dance? Like the flu game, really? Like the guy just brought up a pizza, like get out of here. <laughs> but we all, it was like the most watched sports documentary of all time. Cause again, we're hearing this person's perspective. So as long as we are getting at what people feel is their best version, even if it's, you know, cognitive dissonance in every direction, then it doesn't matter. This is what we'll get. And the journalists will still do their, you know, more deep dive stuff. And, and some of that will be compelling too. And it, we'll just kind of have both. Yeah. And Stefan, I, I, I thought that was, it, it, this is the interesting conversation to have only a couple of months after we had Sam Anderson on that did that great profile of KD for the New York Times mag. And I think that kind of goes, speaks to the larger point here is that there's sort of room for everybody. And Kevin Durant, he was very interested in Sam Anderson's questions and he seemed to take them as seriously as uh, Draymond's. But this is all about trust, isn't it, Rod? Like if, you, you know, you told a story about how when you were an undergraduate and you gave a candid interview and it ended up just being sort of bullet and board bullshit. Um, and, you know, KD realized that he was dealing with a reporter who was smart, who was asked him interesting questions, and it gave him an opportunity to have an interesting conversation for a few hours. And ultimately, to me, that's always what it comes down to. And it's hard for, I think, young athletes especially to know whom to trust or how to gain that trust. And, it, and, it, and some reporters are just really shitty at, at understanding that athletes are people too, no? Yeah, I think, I mean, trust is one version. And I think the other version is consequences, once again. Because, you know, whether I trusted that guy in college or not, which I did trust him at the time, you know, there were consequences to what I said. And it, if, in my opinion, if a reporter is only seeking the things that will have negative consequences for the athlete, then of course they're never going to be trusted and they're never going to get 
the kind of access that they're looking for. But there, and, and I know so many athletes who feel that way. Like I went to school with Marshawn Lynch. There wasn't a person with a bigger personality who was more candid than him. And then he's in the NFL and it's, you know, just here so I don't get fined. There's a reason for that. He put up a wall because he's like, I'm tired of getting burned. I want to ask y'all about this in terms of like just the the news within the 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 interview for a second, if that's okay. Because I'm not surprised that Draymond didn't seem to take a lot of responsibility for offending KD or creating the circumstances that led to the blow up of the team. But we're like, Rod, were you at all surprised that sort of Draymond is like, I'm I'm going to laugh in your face and you guys are going to fuck this up, pose or, or or maybe not. I don't know. Man, I, I, we're gonna. What I'm gonna say is gonna sound a little hateful, but every locker room I've been in that had someone like that, I hated him. I hate that guy. <laughs> I hate that the coaches always like bend over backwards for that guy. Like, I, I honestly believe that. Like, again, they didn't they didn't dig deeper. But if I was KD, and I saw that the team like still wanted to keep this guy around, I'd be like, okay, you made your point. Discipline him for one game for all. Like, if you think that that blow up that we saw publicly is the only thing that Draymond Green does that's batshit crazy, <laughs> you're, you're wrong. That's just what, if that's public, the private stuff is insane. And I hate playing with that guy. And I'm sh- like, I bet that's literally just KD's like, man, like the fact that y'all cater to this at all, like, I, I don't want to do this. And he left. I mean, KD did say later, and this was, I thought, a really good question. Um, you know, Draymond sort of says, like, you know, he goes through the sort of backgrounds of sort of everybody that that KD played with, whether it was Russell Westbrook or James Harden or Kyrie or Draymond, and says that we all have chips on our shoulders and sometimes we all go too far. And Durant first says, you always went too far, but then he agrees. And I thought this was sort of really interesting to hear how these guys sort of come to appreciate and understand each other when I'm sure in the moment, like you're describing, it's frustrating to deal with that guy. Yeah, I think, you know, it's uh, it's a sign of an older player to have that perspective that KD has, which, you know, I matured into that too in my career, where it's like when you're younger, you just kind of like, this guy sucks. I hate him. Like, I don't want to play with this guy. And when you're older, especially when you're older than the, the guy, you know, you start to be like, okay, I get why you're the way you are. And I understand that, like, it's hard to carve out space in this, in the world in general, but in a locker room and to get, you know, imagine you're, if you were Carmelo drafted to the, if he had gone to the uh, Pistons instead of the Nuggets, he'd be the fifth option instead of being on some team where he's the first option. How does he carve out space? Why did Jamal McGlure, this is true. Every time he used to grab a rebound, he'd yell mine before it went up, right? You have, it's hard to get these things. So you don't get as upset when you see someone acting out. But I do think that him saying, Draymond, you were the worst of the worst. Means that Draymond might be the worst in the league, and I, and I, and I don't say that lightly because it, it it shows. And so I thought an interesting moment, and I don't know if you. Got, I mean, it it's the moment that they highlighted it, uh, when they promoted the interview. But I thought it was interesting, and in that KD agreed with Draymond that Steve Kerr and Bob Myers were to blame for the rift in the locker room. But I, I I'm kind of not sure how it was their fault because I. It felt like they tried to say, hey, man, are you going to apologize? Because, like, KD is important. We don't want him to leave. Apologize. And then he, you know, he handled it the way he handled it. But then they said Steve Kerr and Bob Myers are to blame. And I just, I kind of didn't see that. Did you all feel that, too? Because I just, I didn't, I didn't get where Steve and Bob Myers were to blame for this. I can understand each player believing that those people were to blame. And, but I also think, again, without any follow-up questioning, that it was for different reasons. The Draymond's being Draymond. He's like, how dare you reprimand me? Like, I, I run this shit. And KD's like, all you're going to do is suspend it? Like, get him out of here. Nobody likes this guy. I gar- like, I, I sincerely guarantee that there was some other level where the, he didn't think just suspending Draymond for a game was a meaningful action. He wanted Draymond to fundamentally change his action. Now, that's just me reading into it. But if those two people aren't going to put any pressure and they just let one man run this whole show with the, uh, and just above like real reproach, then yeah, I imagine that's frustrating when you're just way also way better at basketball than this person. It's like, why are we doing this? We, we didn't hear from, from Steve Kerr or Bob Myers. <laughs> right. so. And yeah. we won't, right? I mean, there's no, there's no reason for them to ever talk about this publicly, right? Rod Benson, SFG columnist, analyst for Pac-12 Network, professional artist, 
thank you so much for joining us today. Glad to have you on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's a great discussion. Rod is going to stick around and talk to us on our bonus segment for Slate Plus members. And coming up next, our interview with Claire McNear of The Ringer about Jeopardy. This episode of Hang Up and Listen is brought to you by Bush's Beans. Glorious summer is upon us, and that means flip-flops, sunglasses, short shorts, and summertime fun. No summer meal is really complete without the classic taste of Bush's baked beans. They're the sweet, slow-cooked center of the barbecue universe. With the sweet taste of Bush's baked beans by their side, the savory flavors of burgers and brats can reach delicious new heights. Bush's Baked Beans are a secret family recipe of navy beans, slow-cooked with real bacon, fine brown sugar, and our signature blend of spices. They're sure to make your cookout or family get-together meal beautiful. If you want to learn more about Bush's Baked Beans, head to bushbeans.com slash hangup. That's bushbeans.com slash hangup. Just days after Alex Trebek died last November of cancer at age 87, online sports books started taking action on who would replace the beloved Jeopardy host. Ken Jennings, the record-setting winner on the show, was a favorite. CNN commentator Laura Coates and LA Kings play-by-play announcer Alex Faust also were named because Trebek had mentioned them in an interview once. And so were actor LeVar Burton and TV personalities George Stephanopoulos and Anderson Cooper. You could not place a bet, however, on Jeopardy's executive producer, Mike Richards, because, well, no one knew who he was. But after a months-long bake-off involving fill-ins from Aaron Rodgers to Dr. Oz, Richards, who was part of the group conducting the search, was announced as the new daily host of the show. That lasted until last week when The Ringer dropped a blockbuster story by Claire McNear that detailed not only how Richards pretty much stacked the deck in his favor, but also revealed a history of offensive remarks he made on a podcast a few years ago. Claire McNear joins us now. In addition to owning the Jeopardy beat, she is the author of Answers in the Form of Questions, A Definitive History and Insider's Guide to Jeopardy, which was published last year. Claire, congrats on your work, and thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. The whole saga is remarkable, first for the public attention that it created around a game show, and then for your unmasking of Mike Richards as an entitled doofus. Before we get into how you unearthed the incriminating audio and what Richards said, tell us who this guy is and how he wangled his way into being named to succeed Alex Trebek. Yeah, so um, Richards is somebody who, uh, even before he came to Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, um, was was pretty well known in the kind of game show universe. So he's 46 and has been working in TV basically his entire adult life um, and has hosted some reality shows. He hosted a couple short-lived game shows um, on, on Game Show Network, GSN. Um, and he's also done a lot of uh, behind-the-scenes stuff, so a lot of production stuff. And his um, last job before he came over to Sony, which is the parent studio of Jeopardy, uh, was he was the executive producer of The Price is Right and of Let's Make a Deal, which he kind of helped revive. Um, So he's done these very, very big shows. Um, But from talking to people who've worked with him over the years, and we can get into all this, uh, you know, it was made very clear, apparently, to most of his colleagues and employees that he really wanted to be in front of the camera as well. So he was hired by Sony to an overall deal um, in 2019. And then he became the executive producer of uh, Jeopardy and of Wheel of Fortune because our sister shows kind of share a lot of their production um, in 2020. So he uh, had just become the executive producer when Trebek passed away. Um, And then, of course, this guest host process kicked off. So, you know, I think he was well known um, amongst sort of wonky game show types, but uh, he he obviously I think was was by far the least well known of of any of the guest hosts this season. So Claire, obviously you'd been tracking you know who was going to succeed Alex Trebek for a while, and you'd written about it up until you know last week. And I'm just trying to get a sense for when did this when when did these podcasts come get on your radar? Because I, I'm assuming you were 
preparing to write a story about the new guy and everything that went along with that. And then it's like this very random podcast that only had 41 episodes from seven years ago pops up. Jeff Probst had a daytime talk show, which I was cheering for because I, I like, you know, the average uh, white guy host. I cheer for him to succeed because I feel like through his success, I could have some success Aww. hosting. So how did that get on your radar? Yeah. I mean, I would love to say I have some mysterious shadowy source in there. Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> it's just I just I just Googled it to death. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, it's exactly what you just said. I was uh working on a story about the new guy, basically. Like I had done some, I had done a lot of coverage over this last year of the guest host rotation. And I interviewed a bunch of the guest hosts. I've interviewed Mike a couple times, um, and just kind of about the inner workings of Jeopardy and, and what they were doing this season. And of course I was covering the, um, you know, the search for a new permanent host. So, uh, once Variety broke that, th that he was in advanced negotiations for the job. And then about a week later, uh, Sony officially announced him as the host of Jeopardy. Um, and so, yes, I was just kind of working on a uh, deep dive and I was really interested in sort of what I was just talking about his early television career and this kind of previously stated desire to also be a host. Um, so it was through that, that I just started looking into these previous projects he was a part of and, Literally on his Jeopardy.com official bio, that he, though he also talked about it in a lot of other interviews, uh, it, it mentions that he hosted and created this, um, I, I guess, like comedy news show when he was a student at Pepperdine called The Random Show. So this was in the 90s. So I was like, well, I would I would like to see that. That's his first time in front of a camera. Um, and I couldn't find that because... It's from the 90s, uh, so it was not easily accessible. But this podcast that he hosted at The Price is Right um, had the same name. So I found that and I started listening and it became very apparent very quickly that there was a lot there. See, so, I don't want to make this a political show. I know. Because here's the thing with Beth is that I know that you're hardworking and I know that you're out there trying to get stuff going. Mm-hmm. The dangerous side about the crack right. that you just took mm -hmm. is that not everyone is like you. Com yeah. Mm -hmm. But everyone can collect unemployment, which is why we have so many people on unemployment right now. Mm -hmm. Which is why we have so many people on food stamps. Because what if you got unemployment and food stamps? You'd be like, good Lord, I make... You know what I'm saying? Was the show even good? Was the random show... Like, if you get... <laughs> If you get past, like, just the racism and the sexism and all the other stuff, like, was it a good or entertaining show? Did you see any s hint that that guy could replace Alex Trebek in that podcast? Well, uh, I think those are different questions. So um, whether it was any good, it was sort of billed as the inside look at the prices, right? And and after we we asked Richards for comment within a couple hours, he deleted all the episodes and he he put out an apology um, for you know the the comments that we asked him about. Uh, and he kind of has tried to play this off as a comedy podcast, and I don't think that you know that's an accurate depiction of what it is because I mean, so not only was he the executive producer of the Price is Right at the time. They taped this on the Price is Right set. It uh, His co-host was his former assistant. Um, his producer was his current assistant at the time. Uh, they would have like guests on the show come in, like Chrissy Teigen does an episode. Um, and they talk a lot about the Price is Right. So I think, you know, if you were... A big Price is Right fan. It, I mean, it it did sort of work on that level in that it was like this very gossipy show where they would talk a lot about, you know, whatever special episode they have coming or kind of dish about the Emmys and what game shows they think should should be nominated. So, I, I mean, it does sort of offer a glimpse in, into that world that, you know, an executive producer is well positioned to um, provide. I I don't think I would keep listening to it if it were still being made today for a few reasons, one of which is a lot of the kind of problematic language. And they were talking about a lot of things other than the prices, right? It ends up being a lot about like celebrity news and just sort of, you know, what, whatever they're thinking of that day. So it's very, ram it's, it's, you know, your classic, very long, very rambly. Everyone's going to wear one pieces and look really frumpy and overweight. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, that's so funny because... No one's overweight, but but they all look right, terrible in the picture. Yeah, they look fat and uh, and like not good in the picture. It's bad. 
Oh my god, you look great. Hilarious. You look like a Sports Illustrated model, and then you've got One Piece Malones on either side of you, <laughs> which are like, just horrible. I can't wait to meet my roommate because she's literally going to be like, walk up to you in like a bag and be like, "Hey, hey, what's up? Hey, I'm what's wearing up? a smock. I'm wearing a smock, and I'm going to give her a smack. You ready for some news? <laughs> I know the clips that you pull out with good journalistic reason make it sound like. You know, it's like sophomoric morning zoo talk mm-hmm. radio. It's sort of Howard Stern light. Yeah. Um, and to me, it's just sort of another example of the sort of the tyranny of the unserious. But to have mm-hmm. all of this associated with Jeopardy seems wrong. And it's that disconnect between the sort of the image of the show as the intellectual, serious, Alex Trebek driven vehicle. Um, and then you hear this guy that's striving to be sort of you know, the sort of dumbass morning talk show host doesn't fit. Yeah. So, I mean, to to go into um, what specifically we're talking about in a little more depth, um, you know, he it's kind of filled with a lot of sexist language and ableist language and classist language. Um, He uses a lot of kind of ugly slurs. He talks a lot in many, many episodes about women's bodies and women's clothing. And to the point to where Beth got a job being a, was it a booth hoe? Is that right? Yes. At, at CES? It is a booth babe. I don't think yeah. they use the word ho for that. <laughs> what is a booth babe? A booth, a booth slut is someone who <laughs> dresses up in very produc- provocative clothes. I said I was in a uh-huh. t-shirt. Well, so. uh, <laughs> it, she was, in a, she was in a white t-shirt contest. <laughs> What I want to stress, having listened to all of it, is is you know while I was I was almost praising it just now, talking about how it was an inside look at the prices, right? No, it very much is dominated by this language. This isn't like every once in a while in an episode he says this or that. It that was sort of the mood and the tone, and it's one that for the most part is not equaled by anybody else on the show. It was really kind of Richards doing this, and um, you know it, it is clear to me that he was not playing a character or something with, I mean, these episodes were, they probably averaged about 45 minutes and he talks about his family and he talks about his work and he, you know, they talk about the news and it's not, it's not like him just trying on this very occasional Howard Stern persona. Um, this, this was really, I, I mean, you get, you get the sense listening to a, a lot of it, or at least I did that this was kind of the work environment there. Well, okay. Let me ask you a question. Okay. Have you ever taken a nude picture? I'm not answering that question to you, Mike Richards. Answer it right now. Now to your fans. <laughs> have not. you? I mean, I've, no, I haven't. Yes, you have. I have not like naked. I've taken like cute pictures of myself that I thought What does were that mean? Cute. What I does that know. mean? I thought that was like so cute. <laughs> like booby pictures? Claire, you, you mentioned that, you know, it was clear early on that this was a guy that wanted to be in front of the camera as opposed to behind it. So do we have a sense for how well his episodes as guest host went? Because, um, It's not even clear, for instance, that anyone suspected that he was supposed to be among the group of guest hosts while he was guest hosting, correct? Yeah. So um, do we know how well it went? Yes and no. Um, So the ratings on Jeopardy have been um, kind of slowly but steadily falling since Trebek's death, um, which, you know, as as worrying as it is for Sony, I don't think think is necessarily like a a super shocking development because of course after you lose your legendary host who is the face of the franchise like of course those those ratings are going to drop off but um you know you would see throughout this guest host rotation these these rankings it's like here's how the newest guest host did and did in their ratings and and basically with only like a couple exceptions and they were minor ones in terms of the actual numbers every single guest host was lower than the last so mike richards was the second guest host of the season and he had the second highest guest host ratings um so he followed ken jennings who had the number one highest ratings um so you know i don't really know what you can tell from that because i think that has more to do with proximity to to trebek than than anything um the thing that sony and richards giving a lot of interviews as ep over the last year hyped was that this search for the next host was one that was going to rely on analytics and data um and that i think through my reporting and through the reporting of others has has become somewhat suspect um 
you know, we, from talking to people for this story that came out last week, um, it became clear. I mean, he was intimately involved in just about every corner of the process. So Sony has said that once he became a candidate, he bowed out of this kind of search committee for the new host, but he was still the executive producer. So he was still the person training every new guest host as they came into the studio. He was the one literally in their ear telling them what to do or, you know, to do better or to stop doing. He was the one it has come out in the New York Times um, who selected the episodes to to send on to focus group. So, I mean, in theory, like your your very first episode that you ever tape, your, probably your first ever game show is probably not as good as your 10th episode or, or whatever it is. And so to have him involved in that process and, and in some cases to be the only person making those calls um, is, of course, a conflict of interest. So I think there, you know, in my story, yes, we touch on the podcast and there's a lot there that is worth examining. And I think that has kind of dominated the headlines since he stepped down. But it really is also now clear that the the search for a new permanent host wasn't really what it seemed to be, or at least not entirely. And I think that has fans feeling fairly betrayed. So, I mean, it, it seems like yeah, he, he emerges, he gets named the successor to Alex Trebek. You write your story. It drops last week. What happens as soon as the story gets published for you? Like, did, do you start getting calls then? Or like, how did, like, you know, did you get a sense immediately that like, oh, it might be over for this guy already? Well, so to get into the timeline a little bit. Um, so we reached out for comment on Tuesday and all those those episodes were pulled down on Tuesday night, though though we had copies, of course. And uh, we published on Wednesday. Thursday was the long-planned first tape day of the season. And um, not only was it, you know, the contestants coming in for the first five games of the season because they tape a week's worth of episode, um, episodes on each tape day, they also had this um, kind of ceremony they had planned to dedicate the soundstage where they filmed Jeopardy, rename it the Alex Trebek stage. And they had Trebek's family come in, his wife and his kids. And they had all these like kind of Sony dignitaries come in. And they clearly kind of wanted this to be this big deal, special moment um, and to be, you know, the beginning of a bright new era with Mike Richards as the host. And um, he taped those five games. But what has come out and what I've been hearing from people is that I mean, it was it was a very tense day on the set and that a lot of the staff had seen things that were in my story and they were very troubled by them. Um, And so then Friday morning, um, they announced that he was stepping down and they canceled production because they were supposed to tape the second the second uh, week week of episodes for the season that day. And they actually had all the contestants, 12 contestants who were going to be playing that day. And many, in many cases, I've been training for months and years for this chance. They got to the green room and then they were told to go home. So Jeopardy is supposed to start taping its next week of episodes this week. Um, and we don't know what they're going to do. They haven't said if they're canceling production. They had said that um, they were going to turn back to guest hosts. They haven't said who that will be yet, if it'll be new people or if they'll return to some of last season's guest hosts. Right now, Mike Richards is still the executive producer of the show and of Wheel of Fortune. So, you know, it's I think there has been some some outrage that if these things are disqualifying for him to be the host of Jeopardy, surely they must also be disqualifying for him to be the executive producer of the show. And of course, the staff is not pleased either. Um, so it's sort of a, a weird thing that's going on over there. And I, I mean, I frankly just feel for the contestants who who had no part in this at all, and they don't get any vote about who who the host is. And, and suddenly this is you know part of their Jeopardy experience. To finish up, Claire, um, this is really embarrassing for the legacy of this show, which, like as as you write about and I mentioned earlier, is sort of viewed, particularly in the game show world, as like this intellectual outlier. Um, how much does this hurt Jeopardy's reputation? You know, how does it recover the sort of the the gloss of Trebek's reputation? You know, there have been reports that the head of Sony TV is is now kind of in hot water over bungling this because, I mean, he was one of the probably the deciding vote um, in hiring Richards to be the host. And, you know, that they had not found this podcast themselves or kind of looked into all of this more certainly raises some eyebrows. Um, I think that one of the joys of Jeopardy is what you just said, that it is this kind of place of, of 
like pure facts and that's all that matters. And it's never been a controversial show and it hasn't really changed that much. And, um, you know, it was just something you, it, it kind of spanned, spanned American pop culture and American culture in a way that so few TV shows or anything does these days in the year 2021. Um, and, and that feels dented now. Um, and, and, you know, I guess we'll we'll find out if it's irreversible. Certainly, is a show with a massive audience, and that's not changing. It's not like it's going to be canceled next season. It's not like it's going to be canceled in three or four years. Um, and I I do think that there is a possibility that um, if you know if they hire somebody who is less contentious, and it's it's hard to imagine them finding somebody much more contentious, frankly. Um, and Richards exits as EP and kind of ends this chapter for the show. Certainly the show and Sony will be hoping that this is a person who can provide some element of what Trebek did, at least in the sense of stability, who will be there for many years, who will not be making headlines all the time, who will not be sort of reminding people to like get on social media and yell their opinion about Jeopardy, right? Which is never what that show has been and not what that show wants to be. Um, so I I think... I think it's possible this ends up, you know, just being a, a kind of unfortunate blip in the show's history. Um, but but certainly I think it, it is the first time that Jeopardy as this cultural institution does feel endangered. You know, I think one silver lining outcome here could be that it felt like with Mike Richards appointment, the show was trying to pivot to being a little less nerdy and, and, and intellectual. And this may push it back to its roots. Claire McNear writes for The Ringer. She's also the author of Answers in the Form of Questions, A Definitive History and Insider's Guide to Jeopardy. We will post her excellent story about Mike Richards on our show page. Claire, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. If your company's whole hiring strategy is hoping the right person will come along, you're not drafting or trading, you're just waiting. Get serious about building a championship team now with Indeed Instant Match. When hiring gets hard, you need Indeed, the job site that makes hiring incredibly simple. Just attract, interview, and hire. Don't just hope your perfect candidate will find you. Indeed's hiring tools help you cut through the noise to hire faster and smarter. In fact, Indeed Instant Match provides a list of quality candidates whose resumes are on Indeed the moment you post a sponsored job. Indeed Instant Match immediately delivers quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your job description. You can even invite them to apply right away. And according to Indeed data, candidates you invite are three times more likely to apply to your job than those who only see it in search alone. Plus, with Instant Match, Indeed data shows 90% of employers get quality candidates from Indeed's resume database as soon as they sponsor a job post. According to Talent Nest, Indeed delivers four times more hires than all other job sites combined. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash hangup. Get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash hangup. Indeed.com slash hangup. Offer valid through September 30th. Terms and conditions apply. With MailChimp, you get a whole lot more than a URL. You get an all-in-one marketing platform to help drive sales. That means you can connect your data to make more informed, smarter decisions. And you get powerful automation tools like our Customer Journey Builder to ensure you never miss an opportunity to turn shoppers into loyal customers. So if you're ready to integrate your marketing and boost sales, get started today at MailChimp.com slash smart marketing. MailChimp. Built for growing businesses. Now it is time for After Balls. I want to get back to your trivia debacle, Joel. Oh, Not to further okay. humiliate you, don't worry. Sure you do. But to celebrate one of the hard questions. Okay. Honestly, I'm not sure I would have remembered on the spot who the first goaltender was to shoot and score a goal in the NHL. I liked your reaction. <laughs> first, I have to think of a goalie. But then Howard Bryant... <laughs> 
who's obviously going to win this contest, chimed in with the correct answer. It was Ron Hextall of the Philadelphia Flyers. It happened on December 8th, 1987 in Philly against the Bruins. Empty net goal with 12 seconds to go in the game. Let's listen. Bruins come back, flip it from their side of center in on Hextall. He blocks, looks to shoot it to the open net. He has scored! Ron Hextall has become the first player in the history of the National Hockey League, the first goaltender to actually that's pretty cool. Hextall wasn't the first to be credited with scoring goal. You, of course, know who that was, Joel, right? Uh, was it Ed Balfour? It was <laughs> who you guessed yeah, before. That's okay. very good. That's my answer for every question. That's about every goal NHL yeah, right, goal, yeah, right. goalie yeah. question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, the answer is Billy Smith of the New York Islanders in 1979. He was the last player on the Islanders to touch the puck before a player on the Colorado Rockies scored an own goal into the empty net. Seven goalies have shot and scored after Hextall. The most recent was in January 2020. Actually, it's six goalies because Ron Hextall did it again the following season in the 1989 playoffs. The great Ron Hextall. All right. Well, Stefan, what is your Ron Hextall then? I have now been to two live professional sporting events since the pandemic. The first was a Washington Nationals game in the spring when the stadium was at 25% max capacity and seats were zip-tied to prevent fans from moving around to empty ones. The second was on Saturday when I joined 615 other spectators at Catholic University in D.C. for a big game between the D.C. Breeze and the Raleigh Flyers of the American Ultimate Disc League. Now, we've talked about Ultimate Frisbee once before on this podcast, back in 2017, when Josh and I interviewed David Gessner, the author of Ultimate Glory, a memoir about the sport. But we've never discussed the pros, or more appropriately, the semi-pros. The 11-year-old AUDL has 22 teams from Boston to San Diego. My favorite names are the Minnesota Wind Chill which is a nice Midwestern companion to the D.C. Breeze, which honestly, if you wanted to be like region specific, it should be called the D.C. Stale Humid Draft. But Breeze is pretty good because it connotes the disc riding on the wind. I also like the Madison Radicals, which I assume or hope was named for the city's history of progressive politics and activism. Fox Sports 2 shows a weekly AUDL game. Draft Kings is a league sponsor. Players get anywhere from like 25 bucks a game, plus travel, hotel, and per diems to contracts for around $15,000 and coaching a high school team or teaching Ultimate Frisbee in gym classes. Now, I went to the Breeze game because I've known a bunch of Ultimate players since they were kids, and a couple of them are now out of college and playing in the league. Shout out to Jake Radak and Duncan Fitzgerald, and to two more players who also went to Wilson High School here in D.C. and are still in college and playing in the league, Jacques Nissen, who had a ton of assists on Saturday, and Aaron Bartlett. The Breeze game had a distinctly minor league vibe, cheap tickets, The concession stand was basically pizza and beer, hanging vinyl sponsor banners, a try-hard employee with a mic on the sidelines, tossing t-shirts and attempting to get the crowd to cheer. At one point, he shouted that the breeze is blowing, which given that the team was doing well, didn't really make sense. Uh, Little kids in front of us annoyingly but forgivably clapping thunder sticks. There were some deer grazing on the Catholic University sports fields behind the metal bleachers under a majestic summer sky. And once the sun set on what was a brutally hot day, it was lovely. Ultimate is played on an 80-yard field with 20-yard end zones. Players catch and plant a pivot foot. And in the pro league, they have a maximum of seven seconds to make a pass. It can be a little static. Games between good teams like this one tend to be dominated by the offense, but the athleticism is high. There's lots of cutting, faking, all-out sprinting, and dudes laying full out or skying way high to make catches or blocks. And the sight of the disc floating the length of the field during the pull, which is the equivalent of a kickoff, I find that very soothing. Anyway, this was a great game, Joel, back and forth all the way, culminating in double overtime. The Breeze got the disc to start the second OT, which was sudden death, and they drove the field and scored to win 22-21 and secure first-round home field advantage in the AUDL playoffs. Here's how the ending sounded on the league's live stream. Now 
they're close. Now they're close. And they're in. Goal! Jeff Wolvac has it. Let's go! DC's won it in double overtime. It's Bedlam in D.C. <laughs> Was it Bedlam? Yeah, Bedlam might have been a little strong, Joel, in D.C. Okay. I preserve that for, I don't know, the Wizards someday winning the NBA championship or, like, the January 6th riots. But a sudden death sports finish is always cool. Everyone was stoked. Do ultimate players still say stoke? I don't know. And fans lined up to bump fists with the victorious breeze after the game. Good times. Yeah, man. Sounds like uh, a good time was had by all. I mean, it's unless you, you know, we're not playing for DC, of course. But, uh, you know, yeah. I think the funny thing about it is that when you mentioned that you were going to this game over the weekend, I thought you were playing. Right? That's how I didn't have a lot of, I didn't realize that you could go pro with this. And so I was like, oh, okay, Stefan must just be, he's moved from softball season to ultimate Frisbee season. But No, nah, man, I always sucked at Frisbee. I can't throw Frisbee well. And you got to be like super athletic to... To, yeah, to what do these guys a, look like? like what did they look like out there? Did they look like really good athletes? Or? Some of them are like converted really good athletes from other sports. And at a lot of colleges, the teams will recruit dudes that, you know, played high level baseball, football, basketball in high school, but can't play in college. So you get some really fit, strong athletes with huge ups and you got to have some huge ups to play ultimate ups huh that did not i did not know that um well i must yeah. say when i was in coach co of the breeze black dude one of the one of the leading tacticians apparently in ultimate frisbee according to one of my friends did not know i mean i remember when i was in college and i'd be walking back and forth either to football practice or to the college newsroom later and i'd see people throwing the frisbee around on the yard and i was like man that looks like a lot of fun i didn't know you could go pro at it maybe i missed my calling that is our show for today. Our producer this week was Alyssa Eads. To listen to past shows and subscribe or just reach out, go to slate.com slash hangup, and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. And please subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. For Joel Anderson, I'm Stefan Fatsis. Remember Zelmo Beatty, and thanks for listening.